it seems the term guinea pig is a bit controversial in the vaccine world, but should we be relieved that it's not us being the first country to roll out a vaccine? Well, look, I, I think what we should do is be very pleased for the United Kingdom that they are getting this vaccine so early. I mean, obviously, they've chosen to approve this under an emergency approval, which really, I think, gives a sign as to how dire their situation is. I wouldn't be surprised if the United States follows suit very quickly. Um, and so it's great for all of us that a vaccine is going to be rolled out early. I guess to get to your point, um, it's not a bad thing, of course, for us to see what happens in the United Kingdom. Uh, to be honest, the main issue, I think, is going to be around how they can actually deliver this vaccine. The logistics, as, you know, as we all know, are going to be quite dramatic, especially a vaccine that requires such cold temperatures, minus 70, essentially a dry ice uh, esky that has to be sent out to hospitals and other places where the vaccine is going to be delivered. So we're going to learn a lot from how they deliver the vaccine. And yes, by the time the vaccine is going to be given to people in Australia, that means there's going to be several months more experience, many more thousands of people who've received the vaccine in the United Kingdom. And I guess it just allows us to have an even more confidence in the particularly the safety aspects of the vaccine. And how much do we know about the logistics of the rollout plan here in Australia? Is it going to be working down in age groups? Where do we get it? Do we just go to the doctors? Is it going to be pharmacies as well involved, like we see for the flu shot? Have we got that far in terms of planning? We haven't, we haven't received those details yet. I'm sure that's all being worked out as we speak. What we're seeing in the United Kingdom is that because of the cold chain requirements, because you need ultra cold freezers for this vaccine, this particular one, that they're mainly focusing on hospitals in the first instance. And so people, that, that's the, those are the places where they've got that sort of equipment. Um, and so I suspect that will be the main distribution channel initially. In Australia, that may be the case. There is there's certainly precedent for delivering these sorts of vaccines, even in very remote settings. Uh, the, one, some of the Ebola vaccines that have been delivered in Africa actually require dry ice. So you can get it out to really r remote settings. And in Australia, we've got fantastic capacities in our Aboriginal medical services, for example. But my suspicion is that what they'll probably do is start with hospitals and then get the chain um, so that it can get out to other settings, such as maybe GPs, maybe remote settings. But I, I think they're going to want to see first that the, the places that are most equipped, like hospitals, will be the first places. That would be my, my expectation. Jonathan, it was interesting to see the Murdoch Children's Institute today suggesting the research is showing that children who are vaccinated for other diseases like measles, mumps and rubella seem to fare better in terms of either not catching COVID or not showing severe symptoms of COVID. Where are children on the pecking order of receiving a coronavirus vaccine? I assume children have been included in the trials. Have they been included at the same rate as adults? I know a lot of parents around the country will be asking, can we be 100% confident it's safe for our children? Yeah, look, I think firstly, it's important to know that children are going to be lower down the pecking order. These vaccines, we know that they work particularly well for protecting against people getting sick from COVID. We don't actually know how well they work in terms of stopping people transmitting the virus to other people. And we know that that's potentially where kids are most important in the transmission chain. So we don't know that yet. We also know that um, for this vaccine, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, my understanding is that's only been given to children as young as 12 at this stage. It hasn't been given to children younger than that. I believe the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, that does have younger children involved. So at this point, because kids have been under the age of 12 have not been immunised with this vaccine, I, I doubt it would be a priority. Um, and the other thing is that we know that the major priority is going to be the elderly, it's going to be people working in aged care homes and obviously healthcare workers. So there's, there's a, a list of priorities that works down kids are essentially towards the bottom of that list. And I think that's appropriate. We know that kids are not um, currently considered to be at major risk of this disease. That's not true of all kids. Uh, but uh, we also know that once we get better information about whether the vaccines prevent transmission, in other words, stopping people spreading the virus to other people if you're immunised, then that's when you might start tar targeting the younger age groups particularly those adolescents and young adults, because we actually know they're some of the major transmitters of the virus in our community. 
the government's announced there'll be a national register created, you know, noting down who actually gets the vaccine. I imagine that sort of data would be gold uh, to people in your sector, Jonathan. Some people, though, are a bit worried when they hear that their health data is being recorded. Is there any need for concern over that or is it simply a continuation of the way the government collects data about other vaccinations that we all already get? Correct. So right now we have an Australian immunisation register already that collects data on kids and, and adults who are immunised. What they've said is this will be expanded and it will include obviously COVID vaccination and will include all providers. So currently not all vaccine providers upload their data onto that immunisation register. Now they all will. And that allows us to track firstly how many people are being immunised. It allows us to identify people who haven't had the vaccine. And for this one, it's really important because if we get to the point where we've got two or three or even more COVID vaccines available, what we do know is that for each of the ones that are going to be available, you need two doses. And at this point, you're going to have to have two doses of the same vaccine. And we don't want people to get one dose of one vaccine and then a second dose of another vaccine and we won't be able to say whether or not they're genuinely protected. So it's a way of not only tracking how we're going, it's also a way of identifying people who haven't had immunisation and also making sure people get the right vaccine.